This is Dr. Mary Chamberlain, and I am here with Dr. Bess Miller at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Today is Wednesday, November 9th, 2016. I am interviewing Dr. Miller as part of the oral history project, The Early Aids of AIDS, CDC's response to an historic epidemic. Dr. Miller, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes. Bess, you began your CDC career as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer, or EIS officer, from 1981 to 1983. You were one of the earliest members of the task force that CDC established following the June 1981 publication of the first Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report on Pneumocystis carinii pneumonia among homosexual men. You led one of the seminal early AIDS investigations, a study to establish whether the syndrome of unexplained generalized lymphadenopathy in homosexual men was new and epidemiologically related to AIDS. Your subsequent CDC work focused on domestic and international tuberculosis and HIV control for nearly three decades. Before we discuss your work in detail at CDC on AIDS, let's talk a little bit about your background. Could you tell us where you grew up and about your early family life? I grew up in Gary, Indiana, um, a steel mill town in the heyday of mill towns in the 50s. My father was a rabbi, and so we were sort of um, at a high level, or the elite in some ways. Um, and there was a lot of interest in the community. It was very um, organic. People lived near the synagogue where he was a rabbi. And um, so I think early on, a community orientation. My mother was a substitute school teacher. And um, my life was pretty basic. Did you have sibs? Uh, I did. I had an older brother and sister. I was the quote-unquote baby. Um, and in many ways, I remember that fondly in terms of the small town aspect of it. But pretty early on, I think I realized that it was too small a town for me. And I was looking, always looking to, I think, more uh, exotic things. Um, the, I guess the other important aspect of, about my childhood was that my grandparents were all recent immigrants from Eastern Europe, Jewish, they spoke Yiddish, um, and even though at the time I thought that was kind of weird and I was embarrassed, I think it also was exotic to me and I used to make up languages to myself and so I think my work later on reflects that. So did you escape the small town community atmosphere to, when you went on to higher education? Yes, college? I did. I went to college at University of Chicago, which actually wasn't that far land-wise, but it was very, very different uh, atmosphere. Um, and I was a biology major in college and, and took all the pre-med courses. And I'm not sure why. I had no idea that I would go to medical school. It was, you know, I was sort of raised to get married at 21 and be a Hadassah president. So um, after college, I then applied to a lot of schools of public health because I think I was always interested in public health. Um, actually, my first job in Gary was the switchboard operator for the Gary Board of Health. And all the clients were either there for the quote-unquote clap or for dog bite treatment. Um, and that was, that was really my first introduction to public health. Um, and at Harvard, I studied public health nutrition and health education. Um, and that was very exciting. That was, uh, I hadn't traveled a lot as a child, so just being in Boston and being with, there was a lot of, international students, students from Africa, from newly uh, independent African countries. Afterwards, I worked for um, a couple of years as a public health nutritionist. 
And I remember this was in one of the Office of Economic Opportunity Clinics in Dorchester, Massachusetts. And I was the nutritionist meeting with the head of the clinic, a doctor. And I'll never forget, because I think this was a watershed moment, where I was telling him my opinions about how to manage, uh, it was really prenatal patients, many from Haiti who, had, who were gaining a lot of weight. And um, I gave my opinion and he said to me, you work for me, you're a nutritionist, but I'm the doctor and I make all the decisions. And I think right at that moment I thought, hmm, this is not gonna work for me. Um, seriously, I think that was one of, I can't remember whether he wrote me a recommendation to medical school, but I think it was really uh, telling. And then several years later, I applied to medical school. Did you, after medical school, did you actually practice medicine? Um, I don't think you came to CDC right after medical school. Um, I did an internship in residency in internal medicine. Mm -hmm. And I started for about a year or two working at George Washington University, which had a managed care uh, clinic that I worked in. Um, and even that first year or two, it was a shock from the excitement of hospital medicine to the routine of everyday clinical medicine. And I wasn't sure, but it was actually my future husband, Steve Solomon, whose idea it was to come down to CDC. I had not heard of CDC. Ah, so, so he was the one that had heard about the Epidemic Intelligence Service program. Yes. And so that, did the two of you apply to EIS then as two applicants, two separate applicants? Two separate applicants, and we weren't married yet. We, we got married just about two months before we came down to CDC. So when you arrived at CDC, for EIS training in the summer of 1981. This was, as we said, just as these first MMWRs were coming out about pneumocystis carinii pneumonia and Kaposi's sarcoma in gay men. Um, were you, where were you initially posted as an EIS officer? Did you start working on AIDS right away? I actually matched with something called the Special Studies Section in the Center for Environmental Health um, and it wasn't quite what I had in mind. I was interested in occupational medicine, um, and my husband was interested in infectious diseases. So he needed to stay in Atlanta, and a lot of the occupational medicine was at NIOSH in Cincinnati. Um, so this seemed like a good, a good uh, compromise. But when I got to that particular unit, it was very, um, was not very clinical. It was my first epi aid was to go to a small town in Pennsylvania. I'll, I'll never forget this old forge, Pennsylvania, where the community was worried about PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which is something used in electrical works. And they felt this was part of the early beginning of this is a toxic site that we're living on. And so I was sent to investigate, uh, again, you know, with an internal medicine background. Um, and since they were unsure about the risk to me, I had to wear a complete what we called moon suit in those days. Covered my whole body, uh, face mask, hat, gloves. Uh, wandering around this site. Um, so flag that. Um, and then I heard about the task force and I was excited by it and I started going to task force meetings. Um, and right away I was just so excited about that. Now initially there was some thinking that this unnamed disease syndrome could be due to um, nitrite inhalants that um, gay men were using that enhance sexual experience. So uh, my supervisor said, well, maybe that can be a tack and you can be part of this um, 
this task force from here. Um, eventually, I actually moved EIS positions to the Division of Viral Diseases my second year. So you, you actually just kind of had that connection via your first EIS assignment and then, as you said, transferred over completely to viral diseases um, to, to work full time. How, what was the environment or kind of the atmosphere? You said you started going to these task force meetings. So were they, what were they like? Uh, how many people in the room? Where were they meeting? What was, what was it, that, the kind of atmosphere like? It was exciting. It was not a fancy room. I can't remember what type of room it was. And that's sort of um, emblematic of the CDC experience. There was never glamorous rooms or glamorous offices. It was, you know, sort of a hodgepodge um, of people meeting, talking about this new disease. And again, uh, for me, it was learning epidemiology and, and how CDC worked. Um, I was a clinician. And even though way back I had my degree from Harvard School of Public Health, I was still very clinically oriented. But this particular disease and problem was very clinical. And I think that was so exciting to me. So um, I guess my main memory is that of Jim Curran, who was the head of the task force. And um, very charismatic. You know, just an exciting guy who made everyone feel like they were a part of something that was very important. And um, I've continued to have that feeling about him. Uh, it just uh, captured my interest tremendously. Was the way the task force operated, um, was it very systematic in how they went about uh, developing, if you will, a, a, a a program of studies or surveillance to try and chip away at this new disease and find out more about it. I'm, I'm just kind of curious about how uh, Jim and others in leadership positions in the task force organized themselves, particularly since they were not funded at the time directly to do this work. It was kind of pulling people from different components of CDC. What's your memory of, of how they sort of plotted a strategy. I can't really answer that. Um, the sort of the nexus of that very early work was in the Center for Infectious Diseases. And I wasn't there. Uh, that's why I ended up moving. Um, but I was in the Center for Environmental Health. And the, and the CDC had fairly recently been reorganized around these structures. Um, so from the Bureau of State Services and Bureau of Epidemiology, we now had these centers. Um, so I felt lucky to be sort of mooching in and, and getting in uh, from, and, it, and I was physically in a very different place. At that time, the Center for Environmental Health, which has now morphed into something much more glamorous, we were working out of Quonset huts in Chambly uh, just on the periphery of Atlanta. Um, and so my first real true entree was, I believe, in the late 81 or very early 82 when Jim Curran tapped me to, to go up to New York City. And um, the clinician in New York City was uh, someone named Dr. Donna Mildvan, who was the head of infectious diseases at Beth Israel Hospital in New York, and a very, very fun, friendly, down-to-earth colleague. And she had been seeing all of these cases uh, of unexplained lymphadenopathy in, in her patients and was wondering whether this was a part of the other syndrome that CDC was working on and that other clinicians in California and in New York City were seeing. So she wanted someone to come up and interview these folks and draw blood on them and, uh, you know, do a very quick study. Um, so Jim Curran went up with me initially and um, 
I'll just never forget that. We, we walked around New York City. He was trying to orient me to this whole world, the world of um, sexual liberation in the gay community. CDC had already developed a standardized questionnaire that they were going to use for their case control study and for other uh, causes. So we went over the questionnaire and I remember Jim saying, are you sure you can say all these things? You come from a conservative background. Are you going to be comfortable with all of this? And um, my mind was just blown. I, I couldn't believe I was a part of all of this. It was very exciting, amazing. Um, so I met with Donna Mildvan, and that actually opened up an entree to the whole world of clinicians in New York City. Um, now, I think you were in New York City uh, a little bit after that as your EIS experience. When I was there, Polly Thomas had started. She was in my EIS class. And Dr. David Sensor was the health commissioner in New York City, and just a wonderful man. I mean, so many people have said that. I'll just never forget, um, I had chatted with him briefly that I was newly wed and that my husband wasn't real sure about house, home maintenance. And months later, he came up to me during, you know, one of the, the AIDS meetings that he had initiated with clinicians, and he said, How's it going with that husband? Is he mowing the lawn yet? Um, I won't forget that because it was just um, just that amazing aspect of CDC connection and uh, personal touch that um, was very, very wonderful to me. Um, the investigation of the lymphadenopathy patients was also I, I don't want to keep saying amazing. It was very eye-opening and eventually very sad. Mm -hmm. So who were these patients? They were primarily men in their 20s and 30s. The questionnaire elicited such things as the number of sex partners in a week, in a month, in a year, lifetime, and we're getting into the hundreds and thousands because this was the era of um, liberation. So there were bathhouses, there were other meeting places where people might have several sex partners in one evening and do that every week. Um, and these were lawyers, doctors, artists, actors, everyone you work with in your life. Um, and I had no trouble talking to them and uh, had no embarrassment, really, about mm -hmm. their practices. The hard part for me was the blood drawing. Now, one of the reasons I was interested in public health was I was never real good at blood drawing. <laughs> and so, as opposed to in the um, special studies investigation in Old Forge, where I wore a complete moon suit, here I was drawing blood with no gloves and getting blood on my hands and um, I found that ironic later. Um, so what did we find? We found that, again, this syndrome was affecting a population that was very much in keeping with uh, what was going to be termed AIDS. And so I presented that at the first Epidemic Intelligence Service conference that I attended in 82, and we, and we presented it combined with some data from Dr. Tom Spira, who had been following lymphadenopathy patients in Atlanta. Um, and, and after that, it was felt that we needed to have a broader sense of whether this was a trend what was going on uh, between the early years before 1981. It was felt that we needed to do a broader epidemiologic study to um, assess the trend of the diagnosis of unexplained generalized lymphadenopathy and was this something else that was going on in New York City. Um, 
So we decided to do a pathology record review in seven of the main hospitals that were seeing these patients in New York City. Um, and that amounted to something very huge. We were going to be looking at approximately 500,000 pathology reports and, uh, and then lymph node biopsy reports and then chart reviews and so on. And I was in New York, I'll never forget, staying at the Empire Hotel near Lincoln Center, which uh, was a, one of the places that a lot of CDC people stayed at in New York. And in those days, it was not fixed up and elegant. It was sort of a flea bag hotel. And um, I stayed there often for three or four weeks at a time. And I remember hanging up pictures and trying to make it home-like. Um, somewhere in the middle of that study, I called Jim Curran and I said, I can't do this. This is like impossible. It's huge and there's no way. And Jim said to me, and I think I said this at my retirement uh, exit party, and I've said it to my kids many times, and he said, don't tell me you can't do it. Tell me what you need to do it. Do you need an airplane? Do you need a, a crew of 100 people? Write down what you need and let's get this done. And um, wow, that is like a life lesson that I've carried with me. Um, and what we ended up doing is hiring 12 record reviewers. I think the, the health department helped us identify these. And so we had a whole crew and again, I had a clinical background, so this was something very new. Managing reviewers, we ended up reviewing probably three or 4,000 lymph node pathology reports, and then a sample of charts to review, and again, found the trend that showed that between 1977 and 81, there was an increase in this diagnosis, and it was in males, and then when we looked at charts, it actually documented many were gay or unmarried. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, two people that came up to help me, and one was John Kaplan, who ended up being my boss over the years, and another was Eugene Hurwitz. And uh, they came up and um, helped do the record review, and also John Kaplan helped me think about the paper. And again, I had not published during my residency, so this was, think about the tables, think about the end discussion, now look at your methods, and um, just invaluable. I felt that was an incredible experience. I wanna see if we can break this down a little bit more because this, this was, as I said, um, a key investigation early on in, in the epidemic that was um, set up to try and, as you said, address this question of whether this syndrome of unexplained lymphadenopathy was connected to, to the larger AIDS epidemic. So I think you mentioned that you and Jim had gone up. It sounded like it was kind of a, like a reconnaissance trip, uh, a meet and greet with, with Dr. Milvan and, and to give you an introduction to, to New York City and the AIDS epidemic. How long was it before the actual study started and were you involved in, in the planning of the study and the methodology? Because it sounded like there were several components to or several ways that you approached trying to answer this question of, of whether lymphadenopathy was connected to the AIDS epidemic. So I was just curious how the planning and methodology worked out. Was it done with people here in Atlanta? New York City Health Department people. Can you talk a little bit about the methodology? Yes, yes. And the study was done probably a matter of months after the, I think the initial um, interview and, and assessment of the patients was in early 82. And the study I think started probably late 82, early 83. Um, I had a colleague, Sally Stansfield, on CDC. site, a CDC colleague, uh, 
and um, and we worked with the uh, Division of Viral Diseases lead staff, and I remember Larry Schoenberger as one of them. I think he was the uh, division director, or at least the viral diseases section lead, uh, in in um, in developing. Yes, totally. The protocol, the plan, um, not enough about the implementation because that was what I found out when I was in New York City. But uh, yes, I had a lot of guidance from headquarters at CDC. And, and I'm glad you asked that because I think um, that is very emblematic of how CDC works and how CDC uh, strengthens this epidemic intelligence service program by sending people out, often who are novices, to the, the topic at hand and providing, you know, nightly calls and uh, recommendations on a very ongoing basis. So I did have that. So it's a, so in Atlanta, you, you spent some time developing a protocol study protocol, if you will, and then you, you indicated the implementation bit sort of evolved more in New York City, mm -hmm. and I believe that the study, at least some parts of the study, were done in a subset of New York City hospitals. Uh, New seven, York City yes, has 70-plus hospitals at right. that time. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the challenges of trying to select a subset of hospitals and, and what factors went into that selection process? Yeah, um, again, 1981 was a while ago. Um, but my, you know, my recollection is that we basically were focusing on the hospitals where a lot of the reports of these quote unquote ill patients were coming from. Um, and I remember some of the names of the hospitals. So it was the big Metropolitan mm -hmm. and Roosevelt and St. Luke's and, you know, some, some of the major hospitals where clinicians were starting to see these patients. Again, it, by the time we got around to doing that, we're talking later in 82, people were starting to see a lot more patients. It was not when I first examined the patients of Donna Mildvance, that was early 82. So. Things moved quickly, as you recall, in terms of how many patients were being seen and where. Were the hospitals and hospital investigators cooperative? Was there any resistance to doing this? They weren't really part of the investigation. The people we met were um, the directors of pathology because we were not seeing patients. We were poring over pathology reports. So there was neither much help. We had our own reviewers, mm -hmm. and they were excellent. And um, they were not helping, and there certainly was no resistance because, mm -hmm. again, we're talking about path reports. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. would have been very different if it had been getting to see patients. And, um, and I want to shout out to those record reviewers. That also taught me a tremendous amount about... Um, the quality of these people and how much we needed them and we had a party at the end of it and it was a real relationship uh, developed with these record viewers. That went on it sounded like for a long time. Yes, it did. You said you would be weeks, in New York City. Yeah, weeks. weeks. And then come back to Atlanta for right. a mini break and right. go back. Did but you also mentioned that you were examining some patients. Did I understand that correctly? Um, or questioning and interviewing patients? Was that a part of the study? No, it was not. Uh, the interviewing of patients was when I went up and saw Donna Mildvan's cohort of her own patients. So that early. Interview and blood work. For the record review, we reviewed charts, but not patients. So you, will, you certainly were having interactions with some of the infectious disease docs in New York City um, in all of this and, and interactions with the New York City Health Department. What, so it's 82, early 83. What was 
the mindset of the physician public health community in New York City at that time? What, what, what were people thinking about this evolving outbreak? Well, it was getting a lot of attention. Uh, I think there were, there were a couple of groups of physicians that we met with more than others. Um, and that includes infectious disease experts, oncologists, and dermatologists who were seeing Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, some, I remember patients who were beginning to represent, I don't know whether the gay men's health crisis had been set up right then or before then or after then, but um, there were several physicians who were emerging as spokespersons from a clinical basis for the patients. So there were one-on-one -on -one meetings, a lot of uh, group meetings, often called by, I think, the health department and Dave Sensor. Um, and that, too, was so interesting. Um, there, first of all, focusing on the main issue here, these people were dying. So uh, it was horrible, you know, and, and um, getting sick and having terrible skin lesions and uh, it was frightening. And um, so a few people had a little bit of the academic attitude of, well, this will be an interesting paper. I've got to get this into the New England Journal and so on, which did not appeal to me. But for the most part, there was genuine fear of what this was and all these very young people. And in New York City, Again, a lot of artists and actors, and you know, it was kind of tragic, but we didn't know how, how tragic it was gonna be. You, later on, I think, the analogy uh, that AIDS was, quote, the tip of an iceberg, an iceberg of disease, if you will, an iceberg of infection, that AIDS in the early 80s was was sort of peeking out, and underneath was this was this what would turn out to be a, a vast number of people that were infected with the disease. Did you get any sense that, uh, and, and the lymphadenopathy study probably provided a, an important clue to this? Did you get any sense that people were already onto that idea that that end stage AIDS was was as you said? Uh, an extremely uh, devastating disease, but was there a sense of, hmm, there, this could be a whole lot bigger than, than what we're seeing right now? I think I, I would say that, and again, it's hard to, to know what I, what I experienced then and all that I've read and thought since, but I think the, the bigger picture of that comes from CDC. And that, too, I think is something that I've experienced and learned from at CDC, and that is a, a real uh, hallmark of CDC, and that is looking at the bigger picture. When I was out there, I think the feeling was the tremendous clinical uh, burden of managing these, mm -hmm. these patients. Um, and, and there was, an, and yes, what is it? And then, the, of course, the, the question of the causative agent, not only at CDC, but of course in the field. But, um, but the wisdom of, you know, why is this now? And is there something less significant? Um, I would say a lot of it came from CDC. Now, of course, the lymphadenopathy study was an attempt to try and look at um, an early manifestation of the death. So um, 
I give CDC credit, and of course I give a lot of credit to Donna Mildvan and the many other uh, clinicians in New York City, and, and of course in San Francisco and Los Angeles where I did not work, um, for, for bringing this forward and starting to, to get the wisdom of it. But I think in those very early experiences, I didn't see a lot of that, certainly not among the general clinicians or the patients. Now, you were also an investigator in another study that, of unexplained lymph adenopathy in, in gay men, um, a, a, a prospective longitudinal study that, that tried to actually, I think, get at this question of, so what's going to, what happens over time to men with unexplained lymph adenopathy? Can you talk a little bit about that study? That was a different study in a different location and how that worked. That was um, in Atlanta. Um, and Tom Spira, I know John Kaplan, I was involved, and then later many others because that study went on for many, many years of a longitudinal study. I was not as intensely involved in that one, but similarly, I interviewed patients, drew blood, and we were uh, beginning to follow the cohort. But uh, that went on many years after I was available for that. Mm -hmm. So patients were actually coming to CDC for yeah. their interviews and yeah. blood draws? Yeah, we went to, yeah, we used an office, um, regular little office at CDC. Uh, similarly, uh, for the Beth Israel interviews in New York, we used a little office at, uh, at Donna Mildvan's area in Beth Israel Hospital. But, um, yeah, no, no glamorous study sites here. It was very, you know, as, as we've heard from others, the early case control study interviews were done in hotel rooms. It's, um, it's the way we did business and I think it's remained that way for CDC and I respect that, yeah. Besides the lymphadenopathy studies, were you involved in any other early AIDS activities I was involved in one other uh, at the very early uh, stages, and this too, I think, was maybe in the year of 82, somewhere around there. Um, and this was to go out, it was, I remember, it was in York, Pennsylvania, near Hershey. Um, a 10-year-old boy who was diagnosed with both cryptococcal and CMV pneumonia had been hospitalized. And um, I was asked to go because of my experience in the special studies unit and they wanted me, and I believe I went alone on this, although I had the toxicology people at CDC behind me, to do a full questionnaire, the family and the boy and find out you know, were there any infections? Uh, was there any travel, risk for exposure? What was the home situation like? Of course, the main point, and this was very early on in this, so it must have been in the 82, um, was that the child was a hemophiliac and had been diagnosed with hemophilia A at about two months, so had been receiving. Um, so he was one of later when there were many meetings about blood and blood products and whether there should be restrictions and it became an extremely uh, controversial and important uh, event in the history of this epidemic. He was one of the cases. Um, so yes, that was very frightening. Um, he was out of the hospital and I saw him with this sweet little 10 year old boy and his parents. Um, and just the beginning again of accumulating these one after another uh, cases among hemophiliacs and blood transfusion patients. So, you know, with all of this, I think even at the time, but certainly in retrospect, I felt so grateful to be able to be a part of this mm -hmm. and in retrospect to be, to have been a part of it at a very early stage mm -hmm. and then to have had the opportunity later to do many other things but uh, again I think I think something that 
we forget sometimes at CDC is the, the opportunities that we're given and the potential and the, the colleagues that we meet and the gravitas of the issues we're talking about. So it was incredible. Well, after EIS, you practiced clinical medicine in Atlanta for a couple of years. Did you encounter AIDS patients in your, in your practice? And, and if so, what was that like? sort of being on the clinical side of the, uh, the epidemic as opposed to the public health side. Yes, I wasn't sure I wanted to leave clinical medicine. Mm -hmm. So I worked as an internist for several years. Um, and I did see patients who had what would be called AIDS. Um, the first one, and again, <laughs> probably one of the most devastating patient experiences I've ever had was a gentleman who was on the staff of the uh, health management, so I was in working for one of the managed care mm -hmm. uh, facilities as an internist. And so he had been in the administration and I was asked to see him because he was deteriorating clinically. He had interstitial fibrosis on chest X-ray and they were treating him with steroids. Um, and uh, then we hospitalized him. Now, he declined rapidly. I uh, asked for the assistance of an infectious disease specialist, Dr. Carlos Lopez. He said, I think we're dealing with this AIDS disease or the, the gay disease. That's what we were calling it, the gay disease. And um, we tried pentamidine and we failed. And um, he had a very, very rapid demise. Um, the additional factor here was that he happened to be from Gary, Indiana, my own hometown, which is very unlikely, very rare have I run into this. And um, he was gay, but his, he wasn't out and his parents didn't know he was gay. So we had to call his parents, bring them in, and I remember talking to his, his parents and saying, we think, we think he has this gay disease. Well, he's not gay, I mean, you know. Um, and then he died. Hmm. Um, I was about six months pregnant when I saw this case, and I remember nurses and clinicians saying, oh, you shouldn't be going into the room, and you know, don't touch the patient. And I, I did go into the room and I did a normal exam, but that was emblematic of something else that was going on, which is again, this fear of these patients. Now he did not have Kaposi's sarcoma, but still uh, there was very, there was the beginning of rumblings of great fear among uh, healthcare providers about treating these patients. Were you afraid? I don't remember being afraid. I was terribly sad about having to tell his parents that he was gay when, when they didn't know that. Um, yeah, it was the, sort of the two sides of he's dying and you haven't really known your son. Um, so that was one of many patients that I've, I've seen with AIDS. And again, it's hard to explain now that it's so treatable and we see people looking rosy cheeked very quickly after getting on antiretroviral therapy. But in those days, it was something out of, you know, the 14th century plague or, or, or tuberculosis in, in the 19th century. It was just this thing ravaging people. And of course, we didn't know how long they'd been infected. They just looked like they got sick and died in a matter of months. Mm -hmm. Well, it only took you a couple of years or so, I think, before you found your way back to CDC. Um, I'm just at where you remained for a good long time. Um, what, what made you switch back to public health from clinical medicine. I sense that there was always kind of a bit of a tension uh -huh. going on uh, in clinical versus public health. And uh, just curious what, what eventually turned the tide for you to come back to CDC? Well, I found clinical medicine <laughs> routine and boring. Mm 
Um, I, there were things I liked about it. I liked moving around. I liked being nurturing to patients. But the routine was mind-numbing to me. Um, I'll, I'll, I remember a patient um, who was overweight and had asthma and diabetes and some heart problems. And we managed her asthma and heart problems and, and diabetes. And I remember saying, okay, Mrs. We've managed these things, but of course, underlying this is you're overweight. And I remember the patient saying to me, yeah, and what are you going to do about that? <laughs> and uh, that was another one of those watershed moments where I'm probably going to leave clinical medicine. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'm not necessarily proud of that. And I did have the fortunate opportunity of seeing patients in the tuberculosis clinic in Atlanta for about 25 years on a weekly basis. So I saw TB patients, some who were HIV positive, and others, refugees. And so I did, I was able to stay in clinical medicine. When I came back, I knew I wanted to do something clinically oriented. So again, looking at AIDS at the Sexually Transmitted Disease Division, and there happened to be a position in the Division of Tuberculosis Control. And, and when you came, came back. to CDC, back in 1985 to work at TB, there, was, uh, there were some things happening yes. nationally with respect to TB. It was, uh, it was a, a bit of a uh, hot, hot issue. Can you sort of set the scene for us a little bit and tell us what was happening in the United States with respect to tuberculosis? Yeah, um, tuberculosis rates had been coming down for many, many years um, prior to about 1985. Um, and so much so that um, many of the programs in the states and local areas um, had, had really been scaled down. There were, uh, states were getting what, what was termed block grants so they could decide how to use federal funds and th th it was not going towards tuberculosis. So. When I came in, the division was sort of at a low ebb. I'll never forget the budget, the entire budget for the division was $5 million, and most of that went out to the field, to the states. And I used to always say to people, you know, people who are now in the AIDS division and getting a lot of money and attention, I used to say to people, a big day for us is when the pencils come in. Um, so it was, it was sort of, uh, a little down and out. Um, however, in 85, we started seeing a rise in tuberculosis, and that persisted for a number of years. And it was driven by a number of things, both refugees and poor programming. But I think the big part of it was it was driven by uh, AIDS. And tuberculosis is one of the first opportunistic infections that appears at a fairly high immunological state in patients with HIV infection. Um, so TB and AIDS uh, went together again, even in the US. And at the same time, and uh, I think you were probably not in New York at this point, but um, there were many, many outbreaks of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis uh, among HIV-infected patients who had been hospitalized. So that was a very huge thing, and the division grew and grew, and the budget grew, and, and there was uh, a lot of work with, particularly New York City and New York State, to identify um, the problems and the cause of the epidemics, and then to develop an, an, an implementation plan to control them, and that took probably 10 years or so, and was very successful. So the U.S. experience was a bit of a harbinger of what was going to happen all over the world. What, uh, so as you say, this was a, uh, a problem that uh, increased for several years before, before CDC and the states got a handle on it. So there obviously must have been a multi-pronged approach to try and reverse this rising trend of, of, of TB cases in, in the country. What aspects of, of this were you involved in at CDC? 
Well, I think I, I was involved in all of the programmatic aspects of it. So my role was to sort of head, be the medical head of the program services in the states. So it was to look at the states to see where the impact was occurring. And again, we were, uh, a big effort was to increase the budget of the division. Mm -hmm. Um, and to document that there's an increase and what are the issues. Um, I think that was my, my primary role at that time. There were additional programmatic issues that, that I dealt with. Um, there were drug shortages, uh, and so tuberculosis drugs were sort of, sort of like orphan drugs, you know, not not a big market. Well, now there was this rising uh, case rate and there were many more cases with drug-resistant disease, so certain drugs that had rarely been used mm. were in great demand. And I remember a very big effort working with um, the Food and Drug Administration and having joint meetings and uh, meeting with the pharmaceutical associations trying to uh, get more companies to take on these small amounts at that time of so-called second-line tuberculosis drugs and even some of the first-line treatments because tuberculosis treatment, standard treatment, was three to four drugs at that time, but treatment of drug-resistant disease added another three or four, and there weren't that many. Uh, but some of the injectable drugs and drugs like ethionamide were becoming in, uh, scarce. So that was also very, very interesting, working with the Food and Drug Administration and seeing how the two agencies could work together, and that was very successful. And since, there have been drug shortages again over the years, and I've watched that because we saw it early on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Were you also involved in some of the infection control aspects of TB? Because some of these these um, hospital-related aspect uh, outbreaks that were occurring weren't they also traced infection back to control? Poor infection control was a very big part. I ended up working in infection control in Africa ah, so several on. years after that. But during those years that was a, a sort of a mainstay of what had to be uh, how to control the outbreaks in New York City. And so um, there was a, a guideline committee and, you know, probably a hundred page or more uh, recommendation and report from the MMWR on how to, how to deal with these uh, infection control aspects. Um, and that again, initiated the idea that we needed more research on tuberculosis transmission. So um, I, I just want to mention that this was an era where there was renewed interest in research in tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And so um, implementation science from CDC, but also basic science research from NIH, um, and uh, there were a number of meetings to try and develop a research agenda for tuberculosis, and funding went up. Amazing. Uh, in contrast to HIV, a very ancient, old disease, yet um, a paucity of, of, of some basic understanding about, about the disease. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to uh, your, your uh, earlier comment that uh, you spent uh, during this time as you were working on these efforts at TB control uh, domestically, uh, you said you, you worked uh, very regularly at the local county uh, clinic that treated TB and HIV patients. And I was just curious from, from this perspective, so you've still got your foot in a little bit of clinical medicine, what was your sense of how CDC policy and guidance with respect to TB played out in the real world, um, I mean, on, the, on your day job, you're you're doing a lot of um, technical technical guidance, policy, working with state and local TB control programs, and then you're you're out in the real world, where in a sense you're you're 
more or less being asked to implement that. What was that like? How did that go? Working in the TB clinic was probably my favorite part about my career. Um, it was very grounding. It wasn't guidelines. It wasn't, you know, meeting with all the big wigs. It was the patients. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one very early memory I have was um, the issue of adherence to therapy has always been a, a big thing in tuberculosis six to nine months at that time, nine months of treatment. Um, and of course, we've dealt with that and much more with uh, HIV drugs. But at that time, adherence was a big issue. And one of the, one of the patients who had, they had been having difficulty treating. Now, I have to mention that as part of our work at CDC in those days, because we were part of the US Public Health Service, we wore what looks like a Navy uniform, or it is a Navy uniform. Um, and since my clinic was on Wednesdays, and Wednesdays was the day that you had to wear your uniform, um, I went to clinic in my uniform. So with this early patient experience, uh, after all the problems, they finally, we got this patient to complete his treatment, and we often gave like a little, a, a little um, statue to patients when they completed their their TB treatment, and uh, people asked him how, you know, how, how did you finally get treated? And he said, well, I don't know, but as soon as they got that army nurse, she's mean as the devil, <laughs> and I just had to finish. So I was the army nurse. Um, saw a lot of TB and AIDS um, in the early years before, um, before the AIDS clinics sort of developed and, uh, and the Ponce Clinic in Atlanta. And there were several uh, infectious disease clinics that emerged but during this phase. And I remember um, a number of them. One, there were people that came from Latin America. I remember seeing one with a tuberculosis and very large lymph nodes in the neck. But it was not only scrofula or T, lymphatic TB, but also this patient was gay and had AIDS. And I remember the fear and stigma of these patients. So um, people, and this was not something that happens in a TB clinic. Um, it was somewhat traumatic to the whole TB world, which was used to talking about coughing and adherence and had a very, very structured approach, get collect sputum and uh, th two sputa, three sputa, you know, it was sort of rigid. Um, and now we have this whole new group of patients. They're not refugees, they're not homeless. A lot of them were young. And so it was the beginning of needing to talk about HIV. And so now we're talking, you know, HIV has been identified. So we're into the later 80s. Um, and um, the nurses would say, well, I, I don't want to do that. You do that, doctor. I'm not, I'm not going to talk to them about that disease. Um, and so, you know, we would bring that up. And I would bring that up. And it was very difficult, and the patients would say, but I'm not, I'm not gay, I, and I'm here for my TB, what are you talking about, you know? So, um, again, that was to play out internationally as well, but in this country, it took quite a while for the TB clinic staff to become comfortable talking about HIV. Hmm. I want to talk to you uh, a, a little bit about, uh, about PEPFAR. Uh, PEPFAR was certainly not part of the early AIDS response, but something that came along um, much later, but something that you played a, a real leadership role, and so it would be, I think, uh, important to, to have your thoughts a little bit about, about PEPFAR. First of all, just briefly tell us what PEPFAR is. Well, um, let me go back just a tiny bit. Um, in the year 2000, there was an International AIDS Society meeting in uh -huh. Durban. And it was at that meeting, uh, I wasn't at that meeting, but it was at that meeting that there was a decision that we need to try and uh, 
bring antiretroviral therapy to the developing world. And as a part of that, um, the United States felt that there was, it was important to become involved in supporting some of that international effort. It was probably both political and charitable and health diplomacy. Um, and so the first iteration of that was something called the Life Initiative, Leadership in Fighting an Epidemic. Um, and then in 2003, President George W. Bush initiated what would be termed PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, um, and was offering $15 billion, five. That's B with a billion, $15 billion. $15 billion over three years, $5 billion per year to work. And initially, this was in 15 countries, primarily Sub-Saharan Africa, but a few in Asia and Latin America. And um, I had been in the division of tuberculosis elimination starting to work internationally, but I felt, again, this huge draw to AIDS um, and to try and bring some of this huge amount of money into international tuberculosis work, which was, again, very poor. Um, so started uh, in the very beginning as sort of the associate director for TBHIV and kind of maintained that position for 10, 15 years. Um, the experience, I'll focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, which was, I think, the place of more of the tuberculosis epidemic as related to HIV. Again, another another sort of catastrophe. Hmm. Um, tuberculosis programs internationally, and particularly in Africa, had experienced great declines in tuberculosis prior to, here we're talking about prior to the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, then there was a dramatic increase in tuberculosis in the 90s, so we're looking at uh, rates five times what they were. So a country like uh, South Africa in the early 2000s would have four to 500,000 tuberculosis cases, 1% of the population. And all through Eastern and Southern Africa primarily, so Zambia, Namibia, Botswana, um, Kenya, Uganda, Mozambique, all of these, these countries uh, now had these huge tuberculosis epidemics associated with AIDS. So that a tuberculosis clinic in Botswana where, where I visited might, it was an AIDS clinic. 80% of the TB patients were HIV positive. So uh, a number of experiences there. Um, the strategy was very simple. We needed to get all tuberculosis patients, and I'll talk about Eastern and Southern Africa here, but eventually it held India, uh, Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. and so on. Needed to get tested for HIV, and then all patients as they were beginning to come in for HIV treatment needed to be screened for tuberculosis because so many had that. And that sounds easy, but it was enormously challenging. The world of AIDS and tuberculosis uh, in Africa and Asia as well uh, were two silos that did not speak. Mm -hmm. AIDS was wealthy, AIDS was interesting, AIDS was exciting, TB was we were called the Luddites. We were called so many things. Oh, your sputum smear and your purple stained sinks from a, a, a Zeal Nielsen stain that was used to diagnose TB from the, you know, it's a 100 year, 120 year old test. So uh, in all the countries, this was the experience. You know, oh, well, we don't get anything. It's the AIDS people, you know. And um, so again, one of my goals, and of course there were many people working with me and colleagues, was to, to try and use some of this AIDS money to get some of these TB patients screened, identified, and treated. Um, we worked 
through CDC offices in the country. And, and I'd like to mention that because I think this was, after smallpox, this was one of the most CDC uh, international stronghold that had ever been experienced. We uh, initially had about 15 offices in countries, but that emerged into, by, the, by now, there were up to 35, 40 people in 40 countries and 1,500 staff. Some headquarters, but very heavily locally employed staff. So there was a whole network of uh, CDC centers mm -hmm. in these countries. Uh, and we worked with them and through them, and they, the, another sort of fundamental principle of CDC was that we work with ministries of health. So it was never, we just go to the CDC office. It was always a convening power. You know, we're, we'll meet with the ministry. We'll meet with the ministry of local government. We'll try and, you know, gather. And then, of course, there were non-governmental organizations, World Health Organization, the AIDS uh, partners that were working, as well as TB. So it was a big part of our efforts were convening and developing common strategies and work plans and then implementing training. We did a lot of training and we did a lot of monitoring. Um, just a couple, a couple of, of things to memories I have. Um, one of them was in Tanzania and it was, I remember it was 2003 because I was in Tanzania working on this project when Hurricane Katrina struck in New Orleans. So it was October of 2003. And uh, the goal was to initiate in 12 clinics HIV testing using the rapid test kits uh, in TB clinics and we would pilot it in 12 clinics. So, and this was in collaboration with the World Health Organization and, um, and the country itself, the ministry. So. Um, I remember going to the first clinic, going to the first time that a nurse is going to do, introduce the HIV testing. So the patient was a little 12-year-old girl, and her mother had TB. That's how she got there. She didn't even have TB. Mother had TB, wanted to have her daughter HIV tested to find out if she was marriageable. Um, the nurse did the initial questioning, a lab technician came, and then we all paced around, including the director of the National Tuberculosis Program. We were all there worried what's going to find, and then she was negative. So big sigh of relief. A big sigh. So um, it was possible. Um, they used butterfly needles and would throw them on the floor. There was no sharps containers. There was no experience with blood draw in a tuberculosis clinic. Um, and I remember noticing all of that. During that same visit, we met with nurses from the 12 clinics. As part of the issue was, our nurses, our TB nurse is gonna do this. Mm -hmm. This is all new. They were going to do it, and they were very enthusiastic. It was something that they could give to this AIDS sickness, something they could contribute. Um, so that was very, very heartwarming. When we came back uh, headquarters, our group working with the HIV counseling and testing unit in our, at that time it was called the Global AIDS Program, developed a, a very large training uh, manual with posters and uh, handouts to use in all of these clinics to do HIV testing, how to do it, how to, how to get a large group of people in the room first and tell them you're going to be doing it, then individual. Um, I won't go into it in detail, but there was a large controversy about how long HIV testing should take. Should it be uh, the, the original model, which was you do a one-hour testing and all of those persons counseling have had months of training, 
versus should we just do this as a routine test, provider-initiated, very brief uh, counseling. That sounds like it could have been decided overnight. It probably took 10 years. There was over many countries, Malawi and others, people rejecting the, the quick provider-initiated. And then, of course, of course, it became routine. Now, you mentioned observing uh, discarded butterfly blood-drawing needles on the floor uh, and the like. Is, is that where some of the impetus for your interest in infection control-related issues um, came about? Not really. Um, fortunately, that aspect was developed by the sort of a blood unit at the Global AIDS program, working with the counseling and testing and laboratory people to begin to have guidelines on how, and for all sites where uh, rapid tests for HIV were going to be conducted, um, of course, maternal and child health centers and TB clinics and many others. So that became under the sort of the blood, blood infection control universal precautions. My interest in TB infection control came from wandering around, uh, again, we're now in the early 2000s, clinical sites for HIV treatment throughout South Africa, but also Botswana and elsewhere, um, and seeing that there was absolutely nothing about covering your cough. There was no efforts to control tuberculosis transmission. So here we're looking at a very immunosuppressed population all pouring into health centers. Now that had never happened. These people were immunosuppressed and dying at home. But now we're offering AIDS treatment. So, you know, hundreds and thousands of people are coming into the clinics. Tuberculosis patients are traditionally seen in clinics in hospitals. So we have these two populations together. And um, so I felt, and we all felt that this was a, a huge need. And we began to develop just posters, begin to try and, what should, what's first? Well, first, let's just cover your cough. Mm. And covering your cough was complicated because um, we were trying to be sensitive to the fact that coughing into your hand um, isn't the ideal in terms of spreading other uh, respiratory infections. So we thought we would ask people to cough into their elbow and like this, cover their cough. That was rejected by many African countries because it was felt like this is the area where, where you shake hands, where you're, you're, you're touching people, mm -hmm. and now you're contaminating that with your dirty cough. So each element of infection control like that took a lot of, a lot of discussions, a lot of focus groups, a lot of learning about different cultures. Um, and if there's one thing I can say about this, this amazing career that I feel like I've been fortunate to experience, it's how long it takes to, to change behaviors and change cultural norms and how much you have to understand and that things, you know, I'd come back six months later and I think, oh my God, they're still just coughing, you know? And then I realized, no, this isn't, a matter of months. Mm -hmm. This is a matter of years. And for some core behavioral change, as, as we experience in the HIV uh, treatment, generations. So that's been eye-opening. Now, I know one of PEPFAR's um, goals is to try and integrate HIV AIDS programs into sort of mm, a broader health context. It sounds like TB was probably one of the pioneering efforts in this. Um, you're, you're trying to sort of join under one roof, if you will, TB, HIV, um, that they were inextric inextricably connected and bound. Uh, yes, that's right. I think tuberculosis, for all of its stresses and strains over the years, has had over the decades probably since the 60s, a very, very strong primary care at the patient's foot orientation towards treatment so that 
Um, you will find not only a health center that services whatever, 50, 60,000 people, but a health post right out at the periphery. Um, that's been a real challenge for the HIV community to get that far out for many, many obvious reasons mm -hmm. and then for some local reasons. And I think um, in PEPFAR, as in other donor organizations, there's a desire to what we used to call health system strengthening and now promote resilient uh, health systems because in order to get treatment for the HIV patients, it was important to get closer to the patient, closer to the community. Um, I might add that in, in the early 2000s, there was, now we have the drugs, we have the AIDS patients, but we don't have mechanisms to, to treat them. There's no clinics for these mm -hmm. people. And I remember going, this was in Tanzania also, but also in Zambia and elsewhere, you'd go to what was called AIDS clinics, and it was pandemonium. I mean, there were, you know, just hundreds of people wandering, not enough seats. People were cachectic. This was before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Lazarus. This was, you know, people dying, waiting, lying on the floor, waiting for treatment. Um, and so early on, it was looking for other places to treat. It was thought of tuberculosis clinics treating AIDS patients. And that was successful and has been uh, successful. Of course, looking at infection control there was important as well. But um, TB clinics were some of the first sites for AIDS treatment. It sounds like you, um, you had great uh, affection for your international work. Um, so, uh, so, which is, uh, really, uh, quite a, an arc coming from, in your own words, small town girl from Gary, Indiana, who became a, a global, uh, uh, trotter of visiting lots of countries. How, so 30, almost 30 years at CDC, uh, HIV, TB, how has that affected you personally, professionally? Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of difficult transitioning between these country scenarios and coming back home, I found. Um, I was so moved and energized when I would do the on-site country uh, visits um, and when I came home and saw friends just saying, gee, I just went to Nordstrom's or Macy's and I don't really like my, my pants, and I would think, what? You know, they're, they're dying in droves <laughs> across, you know, the seas. Uh, it was very hard. Um, for my kids, sometimes it was embarrassing. I remember when they were like, you know, 11 and 13, I came back with a bunch of condoms because that was one of the few prevention interventions for HIV. And I would bring them home and show them different ones and they would just, you know, and if their friends were around, they go, mom, are you crazy? <laughs> uh, so there was that. Um, but I think it, it, it really, it just gave me such a broader sense of humanity, and I don't know how else to say it. I think um, I felt so fortunate to be able to work on that. And since then, I've been, I've been very interested in development because I feel that health programs are essential but not sufficient, that we need roads and we need education. Uh, and so I've continued to work in that area and, and feel that uh, I've, I've, it's been so gratifying to see patients get well uh, in Africa. And there was a lot of question whether African people would take their medication and so on. And, they have, they've gotten well, and, um, and many of the countries 
are moving forward in a lot of ways, both developmental, commercial, and I feel like PEPFAR has been a part of that. Well, it sounds like it was a, a, a fantastic uh, capstone to a, 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 a rich career at CDC. Um, before we close, any, any additional thoughts that you might want to add? Um, I think CDC is an amazing place to work. Um, first of all, the people are not only bright, but they're, they're really committed. They're, there's an excitement and urgency most people that you work with in CDC headquarters and in the field are very uh, engaged and personally committed, so that's wonderful. There's a lot of expertise around to tap into and to learn from and just to, to broaden your understanding of science and program and the connection between them. And I do love that. I love the programmatic side of CDC. I like program implementation and evaluation. Um, it opens doors to you to, to international meetings and to national settings and state and local activities and uh, training and behavior change and learning about uh, just about people. So I have great respect for the institution and feel very privileged to have worked here. Well, thank you, Beth. Um, I think we'll end our interview here. Thank you.